three, two, one. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel. Hi everyone, I'm Yuka. Today we are going to react to Geography Now, New Zealand. Yay! I'm a Kiwi and Yuka is Japanese. Can you say this word? Tō matawakatangi hanga koa ua ua tamatea turi puka kapiti monga horonuku pokai whenua ki tāna tahu. Good! But that's only because I'm looking at the sign right here. I can't it gives you a kiwi, right? I didn't really study any te reo Māori at school. Really? There's no class? Uh, there is classes now, so it's kind of compulsory. Mm -hmm. But in my time studying in New Zealand, te reo Māori was not compulsory. So let's get started with geography now. New, New Zealand. Zealand. Aotearoa. Now, when I think of New Zealand, really only one word seems to come to mind. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty good. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. New Zealand is one of those places where a few people have made a powerful image for themselves. It's one of the last places on earth to be discovered and inhabited by humans. And when they arrived, it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Mostly because there were these massive 12 feet tall bird monsters. Moa. We'll get into that in a bit, but first... <laughs> New Zealand is not only a key player in the ocean nations, but a geographic anomaly. As in half the time when you look at artwork or decorations or newscasts or even educational books, New Zealand is forgotten from the map. Kiwis even joke about it. Even their government website 404 page not found website pokes fun at it. Yes, that is very true. <laughs> it's a little bit of a bugbear of New Zealanders that New Zealand often seems to get dropped off the map. Australia is always visible on most mm. maps on TV shows, but yeah. unfortunately New Zealand seems to frequently get <laughs> get dropped off the map, which is a bit kind of weird because New Zealand is sort of the same size as Japan, right, yeah, and yeah. no one ever drops Japan off the map. Mm, but I think maybe because we're way, way, yeah, way, way down the bottom. Mm. And so I remember there was an episode of Flight of the Concords yeah, I know. Where, I like that one. where Murray, the New Zealand diplomat, he kicked up a big song and dance about oh, New, New Zealand so being dropped off the map. I like Kiwi humor. Even the New Zealand government did a page not found. We're sorry, something's missing. New Zealand isn't on there. <laughs> so that's sort of like a very self-deprecating humor. <laughs> Don't forget to smash that like button. Anyway, New Zealand, or Aotearoa, is located in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, about 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers off the coast of Australia, and about 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers from the nearest major islands of Fiji, Tonga, and New Caledonia, meaning technically France is their closest neighbor. The country is made up of two main large islands, aptly named the North Island, or Te Ika a Maui, which makes up about 42% of the landmass, yet holds about three quarters of the population, and the larger, yet less populated South Island, or Te Waipo Namu, at about 56% of the landmass. I'm from Christchurch, which is in the South Island. The South Island is for often referred to in Maori history as Te Waka e Maui, so that's the canoe of Maui. The North Island is called Te Ika a Maui, which means the fish of Maui. So apparently Maui was paddling in his canoe and then he went fishing and he pulled up the North Island out of the ocean. The remaining 2-ish percent of the landmass is made up of hundreds of interior and outlying islands, 33 main ones that are either around the main two islands, like the largest one, Stewart Island, just south Stewart of South Island. Island. Then you have the outlying island chains, like the northernmost Kermadec Islands, the easternmost Chatham Islands, and the sub-Antarctic... Su whoa, 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 whoa. The Chatham Islands? The bird. It's pronounced the Chatham Islands. Mm -hmm southernmost point, the Campbell Islands. The country Campbell. is a unitary state divided into 16 councils, 11 regional councils, and 5 unitary regional councils. The Chatham Islands act as their own special territorial authority. The second largest city, Wellington, is the capital. The Correct. Wellington is the capital of New Zealand, which is sort of a little bit comparable to Canberra. How Canberra is the capital of Australia, but it is not the most densely populated city. Mm. I've met some Americans who, when I've asked them what the capital of New Zealand is, they will just automatically say Auckland, mm. because that's kind of the main largest city that they know. 
and when I've asked them, okay then, so what is the capital of Australia, then they'll say, Sydney, Sydney. <laughs> right? because that is the most densely populated city and they just kind of think, oh, okay, that must be the capital of Australia. I guess I can see how it kind of makes sense because if you ask most people what the capital of Japan is, they would say Tokyo because it is the largest city, it is the most well-known, and it is actually the capital. While in America, the capital of America is Washington DC, and that's not the most densely populated city in America. Wellington is famous for the Lord of the Rings and Weta Digital, and I happen to actually be wearing a Weta Digital t-shirt, which my mum and dad brought back for me from when they went to a Weta Digital tour. Southernmost capital in the world, however, Auckland up north is the largest city, which holds about a third of the entire population of the country with the largest and busiest airport Auckland International. Otherwise Christchurch on South Island is the third largest city and holds the second busiest airport Christchurch International. But wait that's not all. The sovereignty claim extends even further and then you get the three New Zealand realm territories and free association island nations. These are Tokelau, the Cook Islands, and Niue. Tokelau is considered a non-self-governing dependent territory. It also has a territorial dispute with American Samoa over Swain's Island. They spelt Samoa wrong. It's spelt S-A-M-O-A Samoa Whereas the Cook Islands and Niue are labeled as self-governing states in free association with New Zealand. Finally, you have the Ross Dependency, which is New Zealand's claim to Antarctica, which of course under the Antarctic Treaty does not actually fall under their sovereignty, but you know, a lot of people like to say Meh. they have something they can't. Whew, for a nation that doesn't even show up half the time on maps, there's a lot going on here. But wait, if New Zealand is just an island in the middle of the Pacific, which continent is New Zealand a part of? Mm -hmm. Ah, good question. That is a question that is kind of stumped cartographers for centuries. In the simplest sense, categorically, New Zealand is a part of the broader region known as Oceania, which is basically Oceania. just Australia plus everything else in Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. Technically, Australia and New Zealand together are called Australasia. However, it's weird because New Zealand doesn't lie on the same continental shelf as Australia. This has led to the consideration of New Zealand belonging to a newer subregion known as Zealandia. Classified by some dude in the 90s Zealandia. as either a continental fragment or a microcontinent made up of a submerged continental crust shelf that expands all the way from New Caledonia to an empty spot in the ocean just south of the Campbell Islands. 93% of Zealandia is submerged with New Zealand being the largest protruding segment. Either way, however you want to categorize it, New Zealand is kind of strange. Wait, go back what? to the self-governing island thing. Do they belong to New Zealand or are they full country? <laughs> Good question. It's uh, kind of like this. Okay guys, look, the British just kind of put you under my jurisdiction, so I guess that means you're all New Zealand citizens, okay? Yeah, but we all have our own language and customs and want to write a constitution for ourselves with free association status. We're basically countries in our own right but under your overarching sovereignty, I guess. Like, your military can come in for defense, but otherwise we got everything else covered. I mean, guys, I have less than 2,000 people on less than five square miles of land on three islands. I think I'll just become a dependent territory state. All right, fair enough. Two kind of countries with loose ties and one dependent territory country with stronger ties. Got it. Plus, hey, I became the first completely solar-powered nation in the world. Not exactly fully functional sovereign nation state by definition, but yeah, good for you. Some places of interest in New Zealand might include the world's steepest street at a gradient of 38 degrees. Baldwin Street in Dunedin. That is a very, very, very steep Road. Have I ever been there? Yeah, it's a little bit close to the university. Something that university students like to do is get drunk and try and run up it. And then once they get to the top, then they'll ride a shopping trolley down. That's just kind of dangerous. But I think the police are trying to stop that because it was causing a lot of damage to shopping trolleys. The National Museum, Auckland Sky Tower. You can actually jump off of it. The Rotorua geysers and traditional... Rotorua has a lot of hot pool, which is very similar to onsen in Japan. There's lots of geothermal pools there. Rotorua has a reputation as being quite smelly because there's a lot of sulfur in the air there, but it's a pretty popular tourist destination. Mori Village, Rainbow's End, and Splash Planet. Rainbow's End is sort of a theme park which is in Auckland. It's basically nothing like Disneyland. <laughs> it's a little bit sad actually. The International Antarctic Center. This is really cool. Is really the cool. International Antarctic Center. This is actually in Christchurch. Yeah. Oh, I think we passed it. Yeah, we, we drove past yeah, it. We, we didn't actually here. go in there, but um, it's it's a really fun experience. Mm -hmm. Like they have actual ice in there and you Very cool. have to get dressed up in like the full on Antarctic grade clothing that scientists wear when they fly from Christchurch down to Antarctica. Hobbiton, so many oh. We went to Hobbiton! 
What did you think of Hobbiton? I loved it. So they actually carved out all of these little houses into the hills, all in that area. I think it used to be a private farm, mm -hmm. which just had this magical scenery, which when Peter Jackson was searching for a location to film his personal pet project, which was the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Nature this area is just sort of southeast of Hamilton. Hobbiton, so many wine. Marlborough is the wine growing region of New Zealand. New Zealand has quite a strong reputation in growing very high quality wines. Fields like the ones in Marlborough, 90 Mile Beach, which is actually only 56 miles. So 90 Mile Beach is actually only 55 miles long. The story goes that the early European settlers named it because they knew their horses could travel up to 30 miles in a day. Unfortunately, they didn't account for the slower pace of traveling on sand. So they measured it by the time it took the horses to walk from one end of the beach to the other end. It took them three days to do it. So they're like, oh, okay, this must be 90 miles. I never knew that. Waitomo Caves with glow. I've been there. It's so beautiful. It's like super, super dark. And then they have all of these glow worms that are up on the roof and all everywhere. And it's like this magical berry light. Is it natural or yeah. natural? Yeah, they're like little bugs, fireflies or, but, but they're worms that have this bioluminescent. Wow, that's beautiful. They glow in the dark. Mm. Worms, frying pan, lake, and the Meraki's. Ugh, what is this? Meraki boulders. It's not that, it's the Moaraki boulders. Meraki spherical boulders. And honestly, I could go on and on with all the natural wonders of this country, but that would take like 50 videos and we gotta cram as much as we can in this one. So let's just talk about all the natural stuff of New Zealand, shall we? Check out the now, New Zealand is an outdoors country, world-renowned for its mm, mind-blowingly wonderful this. landscape displayed in a number of films Nadia, and Nadia. movies. Fun Nadia. fact, the Lord of the Rings gave them so much publicity and tourism money that they even have a Minister of the Rings in their parliament. Oh, do they now? You wrote the anymore. script for the episode. Not anymore. But something that is very cool is when you actually land at Auckland International Airport, do you remember? Mm. They had like all the big statues and everything from Lord of the Rings. And there was like, welcome to Middle Earth. And there, <laughs> there was a period of time when they would actually stamp your passport at immigration with welcome to Middle Earth. I always really wanted to get one of those, but because I'm a New Zealand citizen, when I land, I just show my New Zealand passport or go through the E-gate. So, no stamp in my passport, which was very, that kind of stuff. Is that right, No, because you were able to use your Japanese passport as e-ticket. Uh, e-ticket episode, and I'm just reading off the teleprompter, so I figured you would know that. I did. First of all, the country is located in the Ring of Fire on the convergence of the Pacific and Australian plates that creates the mountainous southern Alps of the Southern Island. Here you can find the tallest peak, Mount Cook or Auraki, at over 12,000 feet. Auraki or 3,700 meters, whereas across the Cook Strait, the smaller Kaweka range can be found on the North Island. This in return makes the country subject to earthquakes and volcanic activity. Okay, so yeah, Christchurch actually had a very major earthquake in 2010, which was the year before Japan had a major earthquake in 2011. That was a, a very tragic time, and I think the hardest thing for Christchurch was just the fact that it took such a long time to rebuild the city. There was just so many suburbs of Christchurch, which were just destroyed by the earthquake and were classified as red zones by the city council and the government. People that had their homes there, they were forced to leave their homes. They couldn't live in their houses anymore because they were considered unsafe. Then it took years and years to get insurance claims sorted. A lot of people had to end up selling their properties to the New Zealand government and that took a lot of time and there was sort of reduced all the property prices because the government wasn't going to pay top dollar for mm -hmm. basically land and houses which all kind of need to be demolished. I think the hardest thing about Christchurch rebuilding was that there were so many micro earthquakes and aftershocks that it really contributed to an overall sense of dread and also caused a lot of PTSD for a lot of Cantabrians who remained in Christchurch 
and they were already trying to rebuild their lives and then there was just all of these constant aftershocks. When I was growing up in New Zealand from 1986 until 2006, we had very, very few earthquakes. I don't really recall any major earthquakes during that time. And then all of a sudden this massive 7.1 on the Richter scale earthquake just ripped through Christchurch at 4.35 I think. And then, so yeah, so, so everyone's asleep and then created this massive shockwave through the city and just like buildings were collapsing, how people's houses were collapsing, chimneys were falling off, it was just like this huge massive noise. And then all of these aftershocks just kept destroying all of the already crumbled buildings because Christchurch had a lot of really beautiful churches and the architecture is very British, old world English style architecture. It's a brick buildings. Yeah, in 2011, Japanese Fukushima earthquake happened. So the time was ring of fire was really active. active. Mm. But I don't think there were many earthquakes in Papua New Guinea at that time. Mm. Papua New Guinea is also part of the ring of fire, right? Mm. But I think its closest area is up by the bow because mm. that's kind of the big volcano. There are about 83 known volcanoes of all types and the largest volcanoes. active one being Ruapehu on North Island. Otherwise you can see other volcanic wonders like the dormant Banks Peninsula on South Island and the eerily perfect circular Mount Taranaki on the west side of North Island. Just to skip away you find the largest lake, Lake Taupo in the Taupo Caldera, one of the largest supervolcanoes on earth. From there the lake is drained by the longest river of the country, the Waikato. Now New Zealand is interesting because due to its shape there is no part of the country that is more than about 80 miles or so from the ocean. The flatter valleys on the sides of the mountains are where most people live and produce crops and livestock. Skip a little further west and you get the least inhabited and difficult to access but most breathtaking part of New Zealand, the Fjordland. Mm, Steep cliffs Fjordland. plunging into the Tasman Sea with Milford Sound being the most popular spot and the only one accessible by road. Now that's quite interesting because Papua New Guinea also has fjords and Tufi. It's really incredible when you fly into Tufi in PNG. There is like a Tufi resort and like you fly in over all these beautiful fjords that look very similar to the New Zealand fjords or fjordland. New Zealand ranks as one of the top most landform diverse countries on earth having everything from alpine forests, glaciers, geothermal geysers, they even have a small desert in the middle of yeah, North Island desert. and on some of the coasts you have tropical beaches with magnetic black sand containing magnetite. Seriously I still have some, check it out. This is from Piha Beach in North Island. Whoa it Look sticks on! Now the one thing about New Zealand that set cool. it apart upon discovery is that other than two species of bat the entire island had no mammals prior to human encounter. Now this is usually the part where Noah comes in but he had a scary scheduling conflict, they couldn't be here today, so therefore, I, Sam, Min, Random, Hannah! Hannah, take it away. The country is a bird haven with over 200 species, Lots over of half birds. endemic to New Zealand. And the funny thing, many of which are flightless. Little it's like the flightless world. bird capital of the world. Species such as the cockapoo. Cockapoo, so they're cute. so cute. But they cannot fly? No. Oh, but they won't be attacked? Like well, cat or? Yeah, they, they, so oh. New Zealand takes wild feral cats quite seriously because there are so many flightless birds like the kakapo, the kiwi, they're all on the ground and they're all sort of endangered. And the kakapo are endangered because they're, they're kind of slow and a bit, I kind of want to say stupid, but Intelligence is okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, well, they're not as intelligent as, say, Kia. Kia are like really beautiful. They can actually fly, but they're really smart, but they're quite aggressive. But the kakapo is actually kind of a parrot. It doesn't breed so often. Mm -hmm. well, so, so there's a lot of conservation programs mm -hmm. to save the kakapo. Look at the cute face. I know, it's so cute and very beautiful green color. Because the kakapo don't fly, they just kind of like stumble around because they're quite big, so they are a little bit easy to find. How big is it? It's like a rabbit size or like a cat size or more smaller? About the size of a rabbit. rabbit. Mm. Well, the world's only flightless nocturnal parrot and they have more species of penguin than penguins. anywhere else on the planet. At one point a long time ago, they- See, so the moa is quite interesting because it's very similar to the cassowary. I think they were actually significantly bigger, mm. but they were kind of like giant chickens. Mm. 
right? And so, how big is it? Kind of dinosaur birds. And they had really thick, warm feathers. Mm -hmm. So the early Maori tribes used to hunt them for their feathers and because Protein. they had a lot of meat mm. in them, so they could actually feed a village and their cloaks. Because they have big, massive dinosaur kind of claws, they were quite aggressive as well. It was quite a big status achievement to be able to take down a moa because then you had to fight for it and Moa didn't want to give up so easily so they were pretty aggressive. So they they're still in New Zealand? No, no, they're extinct. They've been extinct for quite a while. Moa likely became extinct sometime between 1440 and 1445 AD. So that's about 600 years ago. We used to have the Moa, a 12 foot tall monster. 12 feet. That's pretty massive. 3.6576 meters. It's like a dinosaur. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's a serious bird. That was hunted by the native Maori to extinction. What, what does she say? Maori? Maori. <laughs> Maybe because she's talking about Moa and she just had it on her brain, Maori. Then you have the national animal, the famous ki oh, oh, kiwi. Kiwi! So it's so kawaii. Cute. They're so cute. Kiwi is national. Yep. New Zealand. Kiwi. Yeah. So Is it coming from this bird? Cute bird. Aww. Not kiwi fruit. Okay. Right? We're like cute and fluffy, so, but don't mm -hmm. mess with us because we have a nice beak and we can like pick out worms and. <laughs> <So> cute. <laughs> There's, there's different sizes of kiwi. There's a little spotted kiwi, which is like really tiny. So and they're then there's like bigger a, kiwi. walking around the, yeah. like a garden like, or. Like they don't even have, have arms, wow. like for flying. Kiwi, a flightless bird which comes in five forms on both islands. Known for their hair-like feathers, long beaks with nostrils making them some of the only few bird species that can smell. Otherwise, with flying birds, you have the kia. Kia's a mountain parrot. When I would go skiing up at Mount Hutt, kia were quite notorious because when you parked your car up in the car park at, on the mountain, mm -hmm. you had to be careful because the kia would come and they would attack your car and attack your winds shield wiper and peel out the the rubber they're pretty intelligent they are pretty intelligent the world's only alpine parrot and if you see one they are curious creatures unafraid of humans that yeah. love they're not scared of humans they're so cute they will just come straight up to you and they like, get your food and like mess with your shit people taking photos of them they often have warning signs don't feed the kia love to chew on shiny objects or rubber yeah. seriously Shoes. those guys they tried to steal my stuff one time outside of the bird world you can find tuatara these are ancient lizards which are very closely related to dinosaurs they're some of the oldest living looks like an iguana hmm it does look like an iguana reptiles like a turatara which has a third parietal eye on the top of its head or the giant weta the heaviest insect on earth Ugh. look how big that weta is just like the weta on my t-shirt resource wise the country is known for its huge dairy farming and livestock industry Sheep outnumber people in New Zealand. Seven to one. Let me check New Zealand sheep population. 26.7. I'm kind of curious. How many sheep are there in Australia? 63.7 million sheep in Australia. So technically, Australia has nearly three times the number of sheep than New Zealand. Mm -hmm farming and livestock industry. Jade or greenstone is a precious stone mined and sold here, as well often carved into jewelry or tradition Maori tools and ornament. Besides all that though, much of the country makes money through tourism, specifically outdoor tourism, specifically Queensland on South Island. This makes me sad. It's not called Queenland, it's Queenstown. <laughs> Queenland? What the heck is this? <laughs> what is this nonsense? Queenland? This place offers everything from skydiving, paragliding, and zorbing, which, by the way, the Kiwis invented. And speaking of Kiwi inventions, food. Kiwis are without a doubt seafood folk. Seafood folk. <laughs> oh, what, what kind of a generalization is that? Native species like Gurnard, Hokie, 
Hake, hapuku, pawa, and crayfish are made into numerous dishes, cooked raw, smoked, steamed, battered, and fried with chips. If that's not your thing, some non-fishy kiwi dishes might include things like roast lamb, savory mm, roast meat lamb, pies, pies, pies yes. ice cream, Hokey kiwi style burger, cream, yes. kiwi burgers, yes, with egg and beetroot, yes, I approve of, of all of these dishes. <laughs> manuka, manuka honey, honey. Yuka loves manuka honey. I, love it. I like these things. Kumara. Oh. Kumra. Sweet potato. Satsuma ima. Satsuma ima. Sweet potato in Japan. LNP drink. What is LNP? Lemon and pie roa. It's like a beer or? No. It's a soft drink. Mm. It's like mm. a bundaberg. Pavlova cake. Oh yes, um. pavlova. Yes. Look at those beautiful strawberries. And ah oh, man, the texture of that pavlova looks beautiful crispy crunchy i can just imagine putting my spoon into it <laughs> it will just like make that satisfying cracking sound and one of the most traditional mori dishes hangi oh, oh, come on lady i don't know who you are but your pronunciation is terrible hangi hangi and speaking of cultural tradition we go to thank you hannah feel free to follow her on instagram no problem Okay, bye. Yeah, that's a thing now. Now, this is going to be the best part of the episode because the people of New Zealand, known as Kiwis, are the biggest treasure you'll find. First of all, the country has about 5 million people and often ranks as one of the top three ease of business index countries in the world with the least corruption. At somewhere around 74%, the country is made up primarily of peoples of European descent, mostly of English, Scottish, and Irish ancestry. About 15% of the country is native Maori, 7% oh. Pacific Islander, and the rest are mostly Asian of various countries like China, Korea, and Japan. Yes, by the way, pronounced Maori, not Maori, Maori. They use the New Zealand dollar as their currency, they use the type I plug outlet, and they drive on the left side of the road. Yeah. Now we all know that English is the most widely spoken language in the country with a distinct Kiwi dialect. To outsiders it sounds just like the Australian one, but they swear it's different. They have it's some distinct different. Kiwi words. Here's my Kiwi buddy Jared explaining. Bro, it's a beaut. I'm off to the dairy. Is that us? Yeah, nah. It's a cracker, but it's ages and we're in the wops. Egg, you're taking the piss. It's close as. Chop on your jandals and it'll be a piece of piss. Whatever then. Only if you stop rocking me up. Stoked. Sweet as. Nonetheless, there are actually Sweet two ass. other official languages of New Zealand. Māori and New Zealand Sign Language. Making New Zealand the first country to adopt signing as an official language. language. Even though only half of 1% knows it. Now let's talk about culture and the whole Māori thing. The Māori traditionally come from about 100 or so iwi or tribes. Or Look, that's the tribe that I have connection to. The Naitahu tribe. Tribes or people spread throughout both islands, most in the north part of the country, the largest being the Ngapuhi at over 100,000 people. Their culture is a huge integral factor that plays into what it means to be Kiwi. I mean, instead of hello, you'll kiora. often hear the Mori word kiora as a greeting. Most schools teach the Mori language in elementary years and there are immersion schools as well. In addition, they have a few television channels and radio stations that speak almost entirely in Mori. Today, the majority of native speakers are found in the North Island, most heavily concentrated in the Northland and Gisborne and Bay of Plenty regions. And speaking of Mori, we cannot do this episode without talking about the haka. Almost everyone on the island knows one form of the traditional war dance performed by both men and women, known for its aggressive movements, loud chanting, and intimidating facial expressions. Very often it's performed at sporting events. The haka is not only used at games or as a means to intimidate, though. It can be used in a variety of situations, ranging from birthday parties, funerals, even weddings, where the people celebrate the union of two people happily. And everyone takes part in it, whether you are ethnically Mori or non mori It's a tradition that really unites everyone on the island, regardless of race. Pretty cool, right? And now let's talk about tattoos. And actually, uh, let's have another co-host do this. Uh, let's see, which options do I have? Who can I select? And let's see, Hannah already did one. Uh, why not Ken? <laughs> All right, Ken, take it away. You might occasionally come across someone with kirituhi or skin art or tamoko, which are face tattoos. There's so much information that goes into this, but basically, Mori tradition did not have a specific written script. Instead, they use a documented information and history through a series of wood carvings and tattoos. No two are alike, as each person's tattoos told a specific story of who they were. Generally, the left side is reserved for the father's lineage and the right side, the mother's. The patterns can describe everything from tribe, rank, work, expertise, athletic, accomplishments and so on in other news kiwis are pretty athletic you cannot talk about new zealand without mentioning rugby they are three-time world cup championship winners and often when they don't win they place in the top three thank you ken feel free to follow him on instagram 
And now it's time to talk about history. In the quickest way I can summarize it, Bird Island, no humans. Mori come in from Polynesia, maybe sometime around the 1200s. Mori Pa settlements established. Moa bird is hunted to extinction. Tribal battles for land. Abel Tasman becomes the first European to come in contact. They kind of forget about it until the British come in by like 100 years later. For a while, they just kind of traded with the Mori. Inner tribal wars with the new weapons that they acquired by the Europeans. Missionaries, British colony, New Zealand wars, Treaty of Waitangi, controversy with mistranslation. Self-government within the British Empire. Women's suffrage. Massive immigration wave. World War One, they play a role in Pacific warfare against German-occupied Samoa. World War II, they play a role again in the Pacific, but this time against the Japanese in Papua New Guinea. Statute of Westminster Adoption Act, Muldoon years, 1980 reforms, 1990s and early 2000s, business really starts to boom, earthquake in Christchurch, and as of writing the script for this episode, the recent unprecedented terrorist attacks in Christchurch of 2019 occurred, which shocked the entire nation and the world. Although horrific and terrible, it must be mentioned and addressed and not glossed over in this episode. Some notable people from New Zealand or of Kiwi descent might include people like Hongihika, Oneheke, Tepuea Herangi, Maui Pomare, Potato, Potato, Ernest Rutherford, Kate Shepard, Sir Apirana Ngata, Sir Edmund Hillary, Sir Peter Jackson, Jacinda Ardern, Russell Crowe, Jonah Lomu, Sir Colin Meads, Tim Fina Cooper, Flight of the Concords, Bruce yeah, McLaren, Catherine Mansfield, Lord, oh, and the meme page Dolan Dark, I was told. Yeah, quite a few cool Kiwis out there, which brings us to our next segment, The Kiwi Crew. Their friends, the friend zone. All right, diplomatically speaking, New Zealand, for lack of a better term, is basically like Australia's Canada. They get along with nearly everyone, and unless if it's a rugby match, it's hard to harbor any animosity towards them. And even if it is a rugby match, it's like, okay, you guys can win. Just do that haka thing again. First of all, as part of numerous international organizations, New Zealand has harnessed an international network of alliances since its inception. For one, South Africa, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile have had close links as members of the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. These five nations kind of act as like the southern gateways to Antarctica, and they hold a high level of responsibility when it comes to monitoring the South Seas. China has an interesting, kind of good, but kind of controversial relationship with New Zealand. Not only have Chinese immigrants been living in New Zealand since the 19th century, but in 2008, a bold move with a free trade agreement was established, and today they are the second largest import and export partner. The problem is the housing market. Many Chinese investors have bought out property in metropolitan areas that remain unused and empty for the purpose of real estate appreciation. This has left many Kiwis unable to live in the houses in their own country. This has frustrated many of them for a long time, leaving them to ask the government for reforms in foreign investment policy. As this has kind of also happened in Canada as well. A lot of Chinese and Hong Kong immigrants have moved to Canada and just bought apartments. For investment. Yeah, for investment purposes, mm -hmm. but they don't put them on the market for mm -hmm. other people to rent out mm -hmm. or use. Then other Canadian citizens, they're trying to get onto the property ladder and they can't because there isn't enough development or availability of housing. So New Zealand housing prices are going up now? It's really expensive? Well, quite expensive compared to the average salary. As a former British colony, they've always been closely linked to the UK, and UK citizens, often Scottish, choose to migrate and live in New Zealand. Problem is distance. New Zealand is one of the furthest members in the Commonwealth from the UK, and over time, the UK relations waned as the UK paid more attention to the EU. Nonetheless, they've grown up, don't need to hold mommy's hand anymore, and they can handle their own affairs. Then we get to the quadfecta, the USA, Canada, and Australia. There is somewhat of an unspoken, unbreakable bond between these four. New Zealand has fought alongside the US in almost every major global event from the 20th century and on. There was a slight hiccup in the ANZUS security treaty in the 80s in which they decided to initiate a nuclear-free zone in their territorial waters. Nonetheless, relations are still strong and they are considered one of the closest allies. Canada and New Zealand are very close though. They both think very similarly and are both commonwealth nations, with the same queen as their technical head of state. Both share similar views on a variety of issues. Both are the smaller versions of a bigger neighbor that gets all the attention. Business, trade, and tourism is strong between them, and in a way, they kind of love each other for all these reasons. When it comes to their best friend, however, as much as they love to poke fun, mock, ridicule, and spit on each other, they cannot deny that Australia is the closest. Australia even has a clause in its constitution that allows New Zealand to become a part of their country if they should ever want to for whatever reason. Although New Zealand is like, thanks, but 
No. Australia is not only the largest trading and business partner, but also has the closest history and culture. The two have a unique Trans-Tasman Agreement that states that citizens of each country can migrate and have automatic residency. The two go hand in hand, however, when Australia isn't looking, Canada kind of slips in and they kind of go off on secret dates. In conclusion, as humanity's last major expedition, you can imagine how the first settlers must have felt when they approached on this unknown world of glaciers, volcanoes, glowing caves, geysers, and giant 12-foot tall bird monsters. You don't need Lord of the Rings. New Zealand already is a real-life fantasy. It was very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know a lot of things about New Zealand. If you've never been to New Zealand before, please come and visit. Hopefully after it's a lot easier to travel. That brings us to the end of another video. Hopefully you learnt something new about New Zealand that you didn't know before. I think that Geography Now's New Zealand Aotearoa video was quite interesting. I picked up a couple of facts that I didn't quite know before, but Queenland instead of Queenstown. Uh, someone should have done their proofreading. Anyway, don't forget to smash the like button, click the subscribe button, and ring the bell for the notifications. See you next time. Bye. Bye.